loudspeakers. Let's see about ideal loudspeaker. There are a number of interrelated factors that must be considered in designing a transducer for converting electrical energy into airborne acoustic energy. You have seen about microphones. The microphone has converted acoustic energy into electrical energy. Now it is a other way. The loudspeaker is converting electrical energy into airborne acoustic energy. So this include electroacoustic efficiency, uniformity of frequency response, linearity of amplitude response, transient response, power handling capacity, size, durability and cost. An ideal loudspeaker will have six parameters. First point is an ideal loudspeaker would have an electroacoustic efficiency approaching 100%. The second point is it would have an acoustic output response that is independent of frequency over the entire audible range. Third one is would introduce neither harmonic nor intermodulation distortion into its output. The fourth one is it should faithfully reproduce transients as well as steady input signals. Fifth point is it would be capable of producing a non-directional radiation pattern. Sixth point it would be of as small a size as is possible considering the required acoustic output. No single transducer has been designed that is capable of satisfying all the above parameters. Out of many devices developed for the radiation of acoustic energy into air, the two most widely used are direct radiator or dynamic loudspeaker and the horn loudspeaker. There are two different varieties. Both of these loudspeakers utilize the electrodynamic coupling that exists between the motion of a vibrating surface called the cone or the diaphragm and the current in a so-called voice coil. Additional types of electromechanical coupling that are used for this purpose include electrostatic coupling in electrostatic loudspeakers and electromagnetic coupling in telephone receivers. The speaker system itself can be divided into three functional parts. A. The electromagnetic part. This is consisting of the voice coil and the field magnet. The audio frequency electric current in the coil causes mechanical motion of the cone or diaphragm on which it is mounted. This part is often referred to as the driver or motor of the system. Point B, the mechanical part. The mechanical part on which the driving coil is usually mounted and which is set into a mechanical motion by the audio frequency electric current in the driving coil. The third one, C, it is the acoustic part. This acoustic part which transmits the sound energy developed by the mechanical part of the area served by the system in the most efficient and faithful manner possible. This takes the form of a baffle or enclosure with a horn being a form of enclosure. A complete understanding of the operation of the speaker system requires a sufficient view of the flow of acoustic energy from the output amplifier stage to the listener. Basic loudspeaker. When broadcasting first began, the only available devices for converting sound energy into electrical energy and vice versa were those used in the ordinary telephone. Microphones were usually of the carbon type. The hearing device or the, or the uh, telephone receiver was a simple electromagnet energized by electrical signals. These signals caused a thin sheet of magnetic material that is called the telephone diaphragm thin sheet of uh, magnetic material to vibrate in synchronism. 
wearing headphones however was not exactly conducive to listening pleasure besides the reproduction was not of the best quality so engineers started to search for some sort of hearing device that could be separated from the head of the listener and still supply enough volume to make listening easy hi-fi was not really thought of that at that time the two problems faced by the early engineers were amplifying the electrical signal enough to drive the loudspeaker and designing an off the head speaker that could produce this, the electrical energy or electrical signals in the form of sound one of the first speakers designed was simply a, a large horn attached to a ordinary telephone earphone mechanism this speaker has fairly good volume but frequency response was very poor in another early design vibrating reed was used instead of a thin disc of a magnetic material the diaphragm of the earphone the free end of the reed was attached to the speaker cone and the reed's vibration caused the whole cone to vibrate that's the second type a third type of speaker had a balanced pivoted armature located between a pair of magnets electrical impulses through the magnet coils caused up and down vibration the armature movement was mechanically coupled to the speaker cone with the stylus thus producing a sound so these are the three types of speakers in modern use crystal electrostatic or condenser and electrodynamic or simply a dynamic speakers so i i gave an example here a diagram here look at figure number 4.1 that's a dynamic loud speakers crystal loud speakers you know rochelle salt crystals have the property of becoming physically distorted when a voltage is applied across two of their surfaces right this property is a basis of the crystal type of speaker driver this is illustrated in figure number 4.2 the crystal is clamped between two electrodes across which the audio frequency output voltage is applied the crystal is also mechanically connected to a diaphragm the deformation of the crystal caused by the audio frequency signal across the electrodes caused the diaphragm to vibrate and thus to produce the output sound output crystal speakers have been impractical for reproduction of the full audio frequency range because the input impedance is almost completely capacitive thus it is difficult to couple power into them at the high audio frequencies the reactance become lower x is equal to 1 by 2 pi fc you know that and the reactive amount of power smaller in the the bass range stresses on the crystal are very great and the crystals have been known to crack under stresses consequently crystal units have found some use in tweeters that's a high frequency portion of the dual speaker unit and it is rarely even in this application because their response is not linear electrostatic loudspeakers it is otherwise called condenser or capacitor speakers this type of speaker operates on a principle that a dc voltage between two parallel metal plates causes these plates to attract or repel each other the amount of attraction or repulsion depends on the applied voltage if one of the plates is a flexible metal it will bend but the amount of attraction or repulsion is not directly proportional to the voltage applied for example consider the the movable and fixed plates of figure number 4.3 consider this diagram so there is a movable and fixed plate and with no voltage applied now suppose we apply a slowly varying ac voltage to both the plates as the voltage increases from zero the potential difference between the two plates also increases this in turn produces an increasing force of attraction between the plates so that the movable plate bends towards the fixed plate as the ac voltage decreases once more to zero the attractive forces decreases and the movable plate moves back to its original position 
But now we have the second of the AC signal in the negative direction. As that all that this means to the metal plate is that the positive and negative voltages have switched plates. The attractive force is still there, but it is still the same. So we get another bend in the movable plate on the negative half of the AC cycle. Thus for one full cycle of AC, we have two bends in the movable plate in effect a frequency doubling. A 2 kilohertz signal would give us 4 kilohertz nodes. To overcome frequency doubling, we polarize the speaker. That is, we apply a high voltage, 1000 volts also, as a sort of DC bias. Look at figure number 4.4. The voltage exerts a steady attraction between the two plates so that now with no signal, the movable plate is bent slightly towards the fixed plate. Now suppose we apply a 400 volt DC audio signal to the speaker. As a positive half cycle of the signal increases from zero, the voltage between the plate rises from 1000 volt towards 1400 volt. And the movable plate bends from its original position towards the fixed plate. As the AC passes its peak and returns to zero, the voltage between the plates drops from 1000 volt to 600 volt. Instead of moving again towards the fixed plate, the movable plate moves farther away. So we have a situation in which the bending of the movable plate is identical to the AC swing and there is no frequency doubling. A detailed view of a modern electrostatic speaker is shown in figure 4.5. The practical speaker of today uses push-pull with a built-in step-up transformer to work from an ordinary 8 ohm amplifier output tap. The polarizing voltage is applied to the center or movable plate through a resistor that keeps the voltage stable during the vibration in the signal voltage. The signal voltage is applied to the two outside plates. Because the diaphragm is centered between the two plates that attract it equally, there is no bending when there is no signal. Also, because of the push-pull action, the diaphragm can move twice as far in the response to signal voltages for the same amount of compression of the dielectric material. The major weakness of the electrostatic speaker requires that DC bias is that it to be much larger than the applied audio signal. In practical speakers, 1000 to 1200 volts may be used. Further, when we get into the base frequency ranges, a great deal of power would be required to get enough output. To produce such power, the speaker area would have to be very large. So, even though full range electrostatic speakers have been constructed, in practical, Electrostatic speakers have been mostly confined to frequencies above 1000 Hz. The step up transformer and the high voltage polarizing supply is usually built right into the modern electrostatic. Often the electrostatic unit and its matching woofers are sold together as a complete system. Some high class systems use electrostatics to reproduce the high frequencies. Dynamic loudspeakers. There are two varieties of dynamic loudspeakers, electrodynamic and permanent magnet speakers. Both work in exactly the same way. The difference is in their construction. The electrodynamic speaker has a soft iron magnetic circuit, non-retentive of magnetism, around whose center leg a large multi-layer field coil is wound as shown in figure 4.7. When DC flows through the field coil, it magnetizes the ion core. A magnetic flux field directly proportional to the strength of the current through the coil is thus set up and across the air gap. The ion core is not permanently magnetized. It stays magnetized only as long as the current flows through the field coil. 
improvements in permanent magnet materials have made the electrodynamic speakers practically obsolete but some still exist in in vintage radios old radios note that these use a field coil as a part of choke filter in the power supply a good example of killing two birds with one stone the electrodynamic speaker has disappeared completely so far as hi-fi is concerned a permanent magnet speaker reigns supreme permanent magnet loudspeakers the most popular type of loudspeaker today is a permanent magnet dynamic type because of its comparative simplicity of construction and design the precision that may be built into it the ease with which it is interfaced with other equipment its easy adaptability to many different applications and its comparative freedom from electrical trouble the dynamic loudspeakers has found acceptance in all kinds of reproducing systems look at figure number 4.8 it is found in the smallest pocket radios and is a major component of the most elaborate theater systems just about all hi-fi woofers are of the permanent magnet type pm type exploded view of the pm cone type speaker is given in for figure number 4.9 the cone that is the diaphragm is energized by a moving coil the woofer's magnetic field is supplied by a permanently magnetized and highly magnetic alloy instead of a iron cord coil used in electrodynamic speakers the permanent magnet speaker contains a very light coil of wire affixed to a diaphragm and located concentrically around within or in front of the center of the permanent magnet the coil that's a voice coil is free to move in the field of the magnet electrical impulses varying at an audio rate are applied to the voice coil by the amplifier because these impulses are constantly changing in amplitude and direction a changing magnetic field is set up in the voice coil this field reacts with the constant field of the permanent magnet the result is that the voice coil moves further into the gap when the fields are opposite and attract and farther out of the gap when they are alike and ripple this causes an in and out movement of the diaphragm consequently we obtain sound waves from electrical impulses the speed at which the coil and diaphragm vibrates depends upon the frequency of the impulses the distance that the diaphragm moves in and out depends on their amplitude loud speaker construction the voice coil is wound on a cylindrical form the diaphragm usually made from a special paper this is attached to the outer rim of the voice coil form some speaker systems utilize speakers that have aluminum diaphragms the metal prevents the effect of humidity changes and it helps dissipate the thermal energy present when the speakers are driven at high levels of powerful amplifiers high quality speakers use diaphragms composed of titanium aluminum and paper to achieve maximum stiffness required for their mode of operation the outer edge of the diaphragm is cemented to the speaker's metal frame that's called basket the permanent magnet is located concentrically in the back of the voice coil to prevent the voice coil from shifting it must be supported adequately and maintained at dead center however it must be free to move in and out this is accomplished by a flexible spider look at figure number 4.10 with the later cemented firmly in the place the voice coil is free to move in and out but not vertically or laterally permanent magnet the strength of the permanent magnet largely determines both the speaker efficiency 
and quality of reproduction. The magnet must furnish the most powerful magnetic field in order to maximize the voice coil movement for any given signal. In general, the stronger the magnet, the better the power handling capacity of the speaker and the better the reproduction. Woofers are speakers designed to reproduce the bass or low frequency portion of the audio frequency spectrum. For woofers, the designer does not choose the strongest available magnet as adding more magnetic flux will reduce the bass performance of a woofer because the moving system becomes over damped. The designer therefore chooses the magnetic flux level that provides the best compromise between efficiency and bass response. For a hi-fi speaker system, this is very seldom the level at which the magnetic flux is as strong as possible. Mid-range speakers are designed to reproduce the mid-frequency portion of the audio frequency spectrum. Tweeters are speakers designed to reproduce the treble or high-frequency portion of the audio frequency spectrum. As far as the magnetic flux in mid-ranges and tweeters is concerned, the designer usually does try for the strongest flux field possible, of course within the cost restrictions. The typical speaker system is shown in figure number 4.11. The mid-range speaker is a three-way system, is often referred to as squawker. Permanent magnets in speakers are available in various shapes. One example is the magnet in the form of a solid cylindrical slug as shown in figure number 4.12a. A U-shaped iron yoke completes the magnetic circuit except for the voice coil gap. Another type similar in outward appearance uses a hollow cylindrical slug with an E-shaped yoke with almost the entire magnetic circuit composes of alnico. Look at figure number 4.12b. The third type, figure number 4.12c, uses spaced permanent magnets. Here, instead of a voice call, the diaphragm itself, which consists of mylar, stretched taut over a frame that has copper wire glued in a square wave pattern to its surface, actually. So, this diaphragm itself is placed in the magnetic field. Ceramic magnets have several advantages over metal magnets. They are lighter, stronger and less expensive to produce than metal magnets of comparable size. Their development has resulted from the need for lighter and smaller magnets but one that have strong fields. Their principle of construction is very simple. During the period when the ceramic is molded to its final shape with the elimination of impurities, the ceramic is subjected to a very strong magnetic field. When the ceramic is cooled, this magnetic field is retained and we have a very strong magnet, permanent magnet. Voice coil. The voice coil is the only thing present in the speaker which carries electrical current or signal. It is energized directly from the amplifier. The voice coil, as its name implies, is a part of the speaker that does the talking. Look at figure number 4.13. The voice coil consists of a several turns of the wire wound on a supporting bobbin. Depending on the functional design of the loudspeaker, the coil itself may be copper or aluminium wire, although insulated aluminium ribbon is also used. In case of the later, let's say insulated aluminium ribbon, the ribbon is wound on edge with the flat surfaces of neighboring turns adjacent to each other and all the turns held together by a binding cement. The bobbin or the voice coil former upon which the wire is wound may be made of a strong grade of thin paper wound around on itself several times to provide a rigid cylinder. Sometimes the voice coil is wound on aluminium or duraluminium formers and in some designs the voice coil formers are made of rigid paper which is reinforced by an aluminium ring around the outer edge. In case the voice coil wrap gets twisted, it might contact the core of the magnet 
when this occurs the rasping noise develops rendering the speaker useless to offset this possibility many speakers now contain wrap resistance aluminum base voice coils the voice coil of a dynamic loudspeaker can speak only when it is immersed in a magnetic field such a magnetic field may be produced by constricting an iron loop with the magnet in one section and an air gap in another as shown in the magnetic circuit in figure 4.14 the magnet is never charged unless it is in its completed mechanical structure as soon as the magnet is charged it sets up the complete magnetic field when the electrical signal current from the amplifier flows through the voice coil we have a varying magnetic field of the voice coil in close proximity to the fixed magnetic field of the permanent magnet motor action will thus be developed because of the interaction of the two fields of the voice coil moves one way or the other depending on the direction of the signal current as well as the direction of the magnetic field due to the permanent magnet the voice coil is attached to the diaphragm which actually fans the air into motion in order to allow the diaphragm to vibrate back and forth freely it is necessary to provide it with some sort of flexible support that will allow it to have motion it keep it vibrating into a true axial direction the diaphragm is provided with the flexible area at its outer edge sufficiently compliant to allow the diaphragm to flex in and out these compliances look at figure number 4.15 maybe either half roll or multi roll and they are cemented to a main body portion of the cone they are referred to as high compliance type and because of their looseness it permits the cone to move over abnormally large excursions sometimes the rim compliance is accomplished by providing an annual ring of soft cameos leather which is cemented both to the basket edge and to the paper diaphragm a general term used for this edge compliance is a surround because it is literally surrounds the speakers loud speaker impedance the impedance looking into the voice coil is not only the self impedance of the coil but it's a combination of the self impedance and the more important reflected acoustic impedance a parallel may be drawn with the transformer or motor each of these devices draws a small current when operating unloaded indicating a relatively high input impedance when the transformer secondary is loaded by electrical resistance or the motor shaft is coupled to a magnetic load the input current rises and the input impedance of each device is lowered in proportion in other words the lowered impedance has been reflected into the input circuit in each case whether it is an electrical load on the transformer or a mechanical load on the motor the voice coil winding is similar to any other coil in that it has resistance due to the wire used in the winding and it has inductance due to the turns of the windings and it has a small amount of capacitance because it it is distributed between the turns the resistance and the reactance of the coil combine to form the self impedance of the winding without any impedance is coupled into it from its association with the other parts of the speaker the self impedance of the voice coil is modified by the reflected impedance of the load on the diaphragm mechanical inductance is called inertance the degree to which the air tends to stay at rest is a measure of its inertance it is the inductance of the electrical circuit which provides electrical inertia and it is a current which tends to stay at rest or in motion in proportion to the amount of inductance present mechanical inductance when applied to the air is also referred to as acoustic inductance the term inductance is especially applied to the acoustic system and the air in contact with the diaphragm the mechanical inductance of the cone and voice coil structure 
and of its suspension is also a factor in the input impedance to the voice coil and it is reflected back to it with the acoustic inertance. Mechanical capacitance is called compliance. When force is applied to the spring, energy is stored in it. When the spring is released, the stored energy is also released. This is exactly what happens electrically in a capacitor in which energy is stored by the flow of current into the capacitor by application of the voltage. The applied voltage is analogous to the applied mechanical force and the resulting current is analogous to the motion or change or displacement of the spring. In mechanical systems, we call this effect mechanical compliance. The cone suspensions act as springs and offer resistance to cone motion which increases as cone displacement increases. The suspension compliance is a main capacitive effect. Although the springness of the air load and the cone and voice coil structures during flexible add other capacity factors. When applied to the air, this effect is called acoustic compliance. Mechanical resistance is friction. The resistance force developed when two or more surfaces, layers or group of particles rub together. In a speaker of the dynamic type, there are no material surfaces which rub together. Purely mechanical resistance arises in the friction within the cone and suspension materials when they flux during operation. Acoustic load, useful resistance component. Acoustic load is developed by the friction of the particles and layers of the air surrounding the cone when they bear upon each other or along the mechanical surfaces of the speaker assembly when motion is imparted to the air in the form of acoustic vibrations. Mechanical components of impedance have the same relationship among themselves as exist among their counterparts in the electrical circuit. Power is dissipated only by the resistive component. The inertance and the compliance produce mechanical reactants which varies in the same way as electrical reactance varies. Acoustic impedance and resonance The resistances and reactances of the system this includes acoustic, mechanical and electrical effects. The resistance and reactance of the system combine in the effective impedance looking back into the voice coil. This combination is best visualized by an equivalent circuit illustrated in figure number 4.16. The efficiency of power transfer is dependent on the proportion of the impedance represented by Ra, which represents actual acoustic power dissipated in overcoming air friction and in radiating in acoustic power. As in a purely electrical system, the capacitive reactant CC resonates with the combined inductive effects of LV, MC and MA at some frequency called the resonant frequency of the speaker. At the resonant frequency, all reactants is cancelled out of the system and the output and efficiency are far greater than what they are for other frequencies. The curves of figure 4.17 show the effect of speaker resonance on response. The response rises to the peak at the resonant frequency and then it falls rapidly at lower frequencies. The shape of the response curve shows how the resonant frequency can be used as an indication of the limit of low frequency response. The size of the cone is important because it influences both the low frequency response and power handling capacity. The larger the cone diameter is, the greater the power capacity for all low frequency components combined and the better the low frequency response. However, such improvements are not necessarily derived from larger cones unless the voice coil is appropriate. The acoustic impedance offered to the cone rises as the cone is made larger. The voice coil impedance must then also be made larger for proper energy transfer and efficiency. The major portion of the audio frequency signal power 
is in the low frequency component so that the overall power handling capacity is also improved undesired sharpness of the resonant peak can be lessened by electrical mechanical and acoustic damping damping is the addition of a resistive load one method of providing damping is through proper design of the output stage of the amplifier another method of providing speaker damping is through proper design of speaker enclosure woofers there are two types of low frequency speaker the commonly known woofer and the more recent addition of subwoofer the later that's a subwoofer is used for the reproduction of frequencies below those produced by the woofer and it is generally purchased as an add on to a existing system the low frequency speaker provides a bass of a high fi system its sole purpose is to reproduce the low frequency notes of the program source the prime requisite of low frequency reproduction is a large diaphragm the larger the better the smallest diaphragm for any half way decent woofer is 8 inches and for a subwoofer it is 12 inches in addition to large size the diaphragm must be a fairly heavy construction large diaphragms just can't hold up under the vibration encountered under the lower audio ranges a woofer must be able to vibrate back and forth very easily that is have high compliance one way to accomplish this is to have the diaphragm loosely connected to the frame the gasketing that holds the periphery of a diaphragm to the frame or basket is fastened so that it barely keeps the diaphragm from slipping loose but no more as shown in figure number 4.18 with this construction it takes less force to move the diaphragm any particular distance rather than the loose suspension system the cone is supported by very flexible material so that it can be moved very easily by the voice coil the suspension is tight but the sine wave at the diaphragm edge is made very flexible the larger speakers have more extended lows the smaller one more extended highs a woofer must also have a large voice coil to handle considerable heat the larger the voice coil the more the current produced by the amplifier output circuit and therefore the the more the power the woofer can handle finally a strong magnet can be of great help to move the heavy voice coil and cone assembly too well the better the woofer the heavier the magnet assembly to sum up a good woofer must have a large heavy diaphragm a strong magnet high compliance and a large voice coil mid range and extended range speakers the mid frequency loud speaker is supposed to have a good response at frequencies located between those covered by a woofer low frequency speaker and the tweeter high frequency speaker that's a that is called mid frequency loud speaker however some extended range speakers can be used as general purpose units an adequate general purpose speaker figure number 4.20 must have a good response at both the low and high ends of the audio range not to mention in the middle tests by various manufacturers reveal the following data a 15 inch diameter loudspeaker will give excellent low frequency response but will be sadly deficient at the highs at a 12 inch diameter unit will still give good free low frequency response half way decent middle frequency response but not too good treble response an 8 inch unit one of the most popular today is the smallest that will permit fairly good response at low frequency and good response at the middle frequency and good response at the high frequency this is shown in figure number 4.19 
Conventional extended range speakers are now available in the frequency range 45 to 15 kilohertz. 45 hertz to 15 kilohertz. Although they need a good enclosure to cover the range. To obtain this type of response, the loudspeaker must be designed in a way that the diaphragm will vibrate well at the low and middle frequencies, yet have some sort of compensation to permit good response at high frequencies. A three-way speaker system is shown in figure number 4.21. The top illustration in figure number 4.22 shows the converse type of diaphragm. Here, the curvature of the diaphragm allows the apex to isolate itself without the need for special decoupling devices. The center diagram shows the apex decoupler built right into the apex area. The lower diaphragm illustrates the joining of two discrete diaphragms to each other by means of a flexible connection. Thus one diaphragm can vibrate while the other one does not. In the duplex type or coaxial speaker, we have a high frequency horn centered within the framework of the low frequency speaker that's shown in figure number 4.23. However, there is only one voice coil, thus it more properly falls into single unit extended range category. The switch from high to low frequency response is made by a mechanical crossover built right into the speaker's framework. High frequency loudspeakers. There are two main types of high frequency speakers, the well-known tweeters and the more recent super tweeter. Super tweeters can be add-ons or they can be integrated with the system. Six basic high frequency speakers tweeters exist. First one is the cone is a physically disincentive version of the woofer. Second one is the dome, so called because it's dome shaped diaphragm. Third one is a horn, so named because it is like a horn. Fourth one is the hail air motion transformer which uses the principle of lever in its operation named after its inverter Dr. Oscar Hale. Fifth one, high polymer molecular film tweeter. This uses a piezoelectric effect for its principle of operation. Sixth one is the electrostatic tweeter. This works on the principle of attraction or repulsion between two metal plates. Cone type tweeters. Since tweeters must reproduce high frequency notes, they must resonate at high frequencies. High resonant frequencies are obtained with the lightweight, stiffly supported mechanisms. To make the diaphragm of a cone type tweeter light, this must be small. When we reduce the size and weight of the diaphragm, we must in turn reduce the size of the voice coil also. Luckily, high frequencies carry only a comparatively small amount of electric power. Therefore, a small voice coil is not subjected to electrical overload. Without exception, it is wound with a lightweight wire such as aluminium wire or ribbon. The lightness of the moving system provided by the aluminium makes the high frequency response much better than if copper was used. Cone type radiators tend to concentrate radiation of the high frequency components of sound in a narrow cone about the axis of the radiator. The degree of directivity of speaker is indicated by a directivity pattern which is shown in 4.24. The axis of the radiator is considered the reference line with an angle of 0 degrees. Directivity patterns are normally shown 
as a top view in the horizontal plane through the radiator axis. A cone in free space should have the same pattern in the vertical plane. Look at figure number 4.24. The line OA, line OA indicates by its length that the sound radiated along this particular line is a maximum in comparison to that in any other direction. At an angle 45 degree, the line OB is a measure of the relative sound intensity in that direction. Since OB is only half as long as OA, a listener along OB would listen only about half the volume compared to what a person along OA at angles nine, near 90 degree. The pattern indicates minimum radiation, zero radiation. In any practical setup, such a zero area would not exist because sound waves reach there by reflection. Because directivity normally varies considerably with the frequency, the complete diagram, that is figure number 4.25, the complete diagram must show separate patterns for each of at least several frequencies. Figure number 4.25 depicts variation of directivity with a frequency for a 12 inch cone, assuming that the speaker is mounted in an infinite baffle. Notice how much narrower the radiation pattern as at highs than at lows. A single cone type tweeter, single cone type tweeter distributes high frequency sounds unevenly. It lobes the high frequencies directly out in front and tends to cause a drop off at the sides. This effect can be overcome by arranging two or more cone tweeters as shown in figure number 4.26. In this way, overlapping individual lobes from separate speakers cover the listening area. Dome type tweeters Uniformly dispersed flat energy response begins with the speaker system ability to radiate sound at all frequencies evenly in all directions. Even dispersion of sound energy means that the sound emanating from the program source will be heard same by listeners in all parts of the room. For low frequency sounds, this problem of dispersion is not a practical consequence. Since they are very nearly omnidirectional, the limiting factor for high frequency sounds is that the speaker will begin to be directional. When its circumference equals the wavelength of the frequency being reproduced. Directionality increases as the wavelength decreases with respect to the speaker's dimensions. The laws of physics dictate the most direct approach to the problem of even dispersion of high frequency energy. The drivers used must be as small as possible. Dome tweeters that is figure number 4.27 are designed According to this principle, in order to use these physical laws to the listener's advantage. Horn type tweeters. To obtain reasonable output from a loudspeaker, we must vibrate large amount of air. For this, we must usually have a fairly large vibrating surfaces, such as the cones in woofers. The larger the cone surface, the greater the output. But the tweeter's cone, that's a diaphragm, must be small to attain its high frequency response. Thus, only a small amount of air can be moved, reducing the output power. We can increase the acoustic output from any type of diaphragm if we couple directly to a horn, converting the system to a horn loaded one. Look at figure number 4.28. This particular figure shows the relative difference in size between the diaphragms of a cone type tweeter and a horn loaded one. The driving force of the voice coil of the latter is distributed between the small mass of the diaphragm and the mass of air in the horn. Since air weighs much less than the paper or metal, the overall load on the voice coil 
for the same acoustic output as that of the cone type tweeter can be greatly reduced. Also for the same electrical input, the output of the horn loaded system is greater. A horn is a tube so flared, tapered that the diameter increases from a small value at one end called the throat to a larger value at the other end called the mouth. Horns, figure number 4.28b. Horns have been used for centuries for increasing the radiation of the human voice and musical instruments. The horn does acoustically what the cone does mechanically. It couples the small voice coil area to a large area of air. In this way, the horn acts as an acoustic transformer and converts the relatively high impedance of the throat and the driver. The horn is a fixed physical boundary for its closed column of air and does not vibrate itself. Acoustic energy fed to its throat must therefore be obtained from a vibrating diaphragm which converts mechanical motion from the driver voice coil to acoustic energy. Although the cone type radiator acts as both diaphragm and radiator and transducer from mechanical to acoustic energy, the horn acts only as a radiator with both input and output energy being acoustic. For maximum efficiency, horn driver units such as one shown in figure number 4.29, the cone, the the horn driver units. Horn driver units are of the compression type. The back of the driver is completely sealed to provide a stiff air cushion behind the diaphragm. The sealed in stiff air cushion is the underlying principle of acoustic suspension or air suspension speaker system. Any device that radiates energy into three-dimensional space has certain very specific directional properties. For example, an unshaded light bulb is pretty much omnidirectional casting illumination in, a, in most direction. Like lamps, speaker have definite directional characteristics. At very low frequencies, any speaker is virtually omnidi omnidirectional. The directional characteristics of a speaker change with the frequency of the sound being generated, particularly with the, how the wavelength of the sound relates to the physical size of the speaker's diaphragm. For a flat circular cone, dispersion will be virtually omnidirectional for frequencies with wavelength that are more than four times the diameter of the cone. Dispersion narrows to approximately 60 degree when the wavelength equals the diameter and to 30 degree when the wavelength is half the diameter. A speaker with a 2 inch radiating surface will be practically omnidirectional at 1 kHz and it will radiate a 10 kHz tone in a beam not much more than 30 degree wide. Horns can be and are designed for controlled wide angle distribution. Such horns are square or rectangular. These horns achieve similar results in different manners. The diffraction horn, that is figure number 4.30. The diffraction horn operates on the principle that the sound coming from a narrow slit, which is small compared to a wavelength, emerges in a cylindrical wavefront pattern from the slit. That is, the wavefront diffracts out of the narrow slit. This type of horn has smooth angular response with no lobes or valleys in the sound pattern. The reciprocating flare horn in figure number 4.31 distributes the sound over a wide angle by reversing the direction in which the pressure builds up within the horn. Its mouth construction is designed for horizontal dispersion. The horn first expands rapidly in a vertical direction with practically no horizontal expansion. 
the sound pressure traveling along such a channel finds it relatively easy to expand vertically but in trying to expand horizontally the sound pressure builds up along the side walls of the horn the result is that the sound comes out from the horizontally shaped mouth with exceptionally wide horizontal dispersion the sectoral or multicellular horn in figure number 4.32 is similar to the reciprocating flare horn except that the mouth of the horn is compartmentalized to diffuse the sound over a wide area what we have here is a sort of shower head that spreads the sound much like a shower head which spreads the water coming from it high fidelity it's called hi fi There are several schools of thought concerning high fidelity. Played exactly as performed school, played so it sounds real school, and played the way I like it to hear at school. There is a logic in all three three approaches. We must accept that there are as many types of high fidelity as there are listeners. In order to satisfy these concepts, it is necessary to provide a sufficient variety of component parts. to make possible many different kinds of system we have discussed speakers from the point of view of their general application of the hi fi field there is no exact scientific operational definition of a hi fi system as it standards and specified measurements of performance of a system have not been possible to establish because because of the limitations of the human ear and because of variations in human taste room acoustics di- system distortions noise and comparative volume levels a commonly accepted concept of hi fi sound is that it is reproduced sound with a high degree of similarity to that of a original or live sound that has traveled from a source and that has undergone several conversions through a system or a several systems hi fi is felt to be achieved when the sound that is reproduced has negligible distortion from the original when it has little extraneous uh, uh, noise and when the volume levels and acoustic effects are pleasing to hear reproduction of sound is something like a photograph the picture cannot carry the original scene to the viewer in very every detail some features of the picture may be deemphasized whereas other features may be emphasized intentionally or distortion may be introduced for purely aesthetic reasons distortion of this type can greatly improve the illusion that the photographer is trying to create in the same way the picture can be spoiled by undesirable distortion and effects such as poor focus poor film and improper lighting like photography modern hi fi techniques encompass controls for modification of the original so original sounds to compensate for certain defects and make provision to actually improve the effects according to an individual listener's taste undesirable distortions differences in comparative sound levels and injection of extraneous noise are also held to a minimum so that the pleasing qualities of the original sound will not be reduced in addition modern concepts of hi fi take into consideration to the listener his ear mechanism and his nervous response plus his listening experience and training the word presence is used to describe the degree of realism of the reproduced sound this term suggests that the reproduction is so real that the listener can feel the presence of the sound source that is causing live sound even though the source may be extinct a complete hi fi system may be divided into functional sections as illustrated in figure 4.33 the the way in which the output differs from an input or a desired ideal output is called distortion distortion may be created in any one or more of the sections if more than one section is causing distortion the final output sound may reflect 
the sum of the distortion from all the distorting sections. The section may be purposely designed to introduce distortion of a particular type which compensates for inherent distortion in another section. For example, bass and treble boost circuits can be used to offset the falling of, of the response of a speaker at the highest and lower frequency portions of the response range. The hi-fi system is somewhat like a chain which is likely to be limited in overall performance by its weakest section. But the chain analogy breaks down in the foregoing case in which the distortion introduced by one section may be used to compensate for distortion in another section. The speaker system is a weakest link in the hi-fi equipment chain because two conversions of energy must take place electrical to mechanical to acoustic. Such energy conversion is known as transduction and the devices which affect it are known as transducers. Input devices such as uh, phono pickups and microphones are also transducers and they have many of the same weaknesses as speakers though to a lesser degree because of the relatively low power levels at which they operate. Input devices provide transduction between sound input and electrical output. Just the reverse of the action in the speakers. The amplifier system can also contribute distortion. The voltage amplifier stages are least troublesome. The power amplifier stage is an important contributor to the overall distortion in the system. Keeping in mind the types of misperfection or imperfections and distortions they can produce or they can introduce. We may now summarize the features of a theoretically ideal system. There are five points. First point, interpret, amplify, compensate and reproduce sound components of any and all frequencies in the audible range with with good efficiency. Second point, add negligible frequency components not in the original sound. Third one, distribute the sound in such a way that its sources would appear to be located nearly the same as they were in the original and so that the quality of the sound would be independent of the location of the listener with respect to the speaker system. Fourth point, allow negligible unnatural delay of some frequency components relative to others. Fifth point, reproduce without resonance effects or hangover the sudden large changes in sound volume levels. Multi-speaker systems will now concentrate on the more specific and specialized units that become component parts in the more expanded hi-fi reproducer systems. Multi-speaker systems have much to offer for good hi-fi reproduction in the way of characteristics that are virtually impossible to obtain from a single wide range speaker. Advantages derived from multi-speaker systems are due to the fact that with two, three or four speakers in a reproducing system, we have better control of the overall performance characteristics of the system, control of the individual component break speakers. The situation may be likened to the difference between having only one ceiling lighting fixture in a room to provide overall illumination and having several lamps in corner and on tables to provide more adequate light coverage in a specific areas where light is most needed and in degrees best suited to those areas. Since multi-speaker system, look at figure number 4.34 and 4.35. Multi-speaker systems are composed of combination of special purpose speakers. The multi-speaker system as a whole is a very efficient system. Multi-speaker systems have the following advantages. Multi-speaker systems have reserve power handling capacity necessary for high program burst. Second one is multi-speaker system reduce intermodulation distortion. Third one is multi-speaker system may be balanced one against the other by means of volume controls to give that particular feeling of concert hall reality that most pleases the 
listener. Fourth point, a smooth overall response may be obtained from multi-speaker system. Fifth point, multi-speaker systems have compatible roll off or cut off characteristics. Speaker ranges overall. Sixth one, multi-speaker systems provide flexibility of performance. Crossover networks in multi-speaker systems in which specialized speakers are used for different frequency bands. It is necessary and desirable to segregate different bands of frequencies into their respective speakers designed to handle them. These, this particular segregation of various bands of acoustic energy ensures optimum utilization of audio power resulting in better overall performance of the system. The simplest type of network consists merely of a single capacitor as illustrated in figure number 4.36a. The fact that the reactance of a capacitor is inversely proportional to the frequency which is employed to distribute the audio signal. The tweeter and woofer voice coils are connected in series and a capacitor is connected across the woofer. The value of the capacitance is made such that Frequencies above the range of the woofer, the resistance of C becomes so low that it shunts the woofer, which acts as a bypass capacitor. The low frequency components can be kept out of the speaker or kept out of the tweeter if a parallel connection of the voice coil is used with a capacitor in series with the tweeter circuit, which is shown in figure number 4.36b. Inductance Inductance can be used along with the capacitors to make the crossover network more complete. For example, 4.36b, the inductance L can be connected in series with the woofer. Look at that diagram. It is in series with the woofer leads. The inductance, the reactance of which increases the frequency, chokes the high frequency components out of the woofer. And the capacitor C blocks the low frequency components out of the teeter. The values of C and L must be such that the reactance in each case is a little lower than the voice coil impedance in the frequency range to be attenuated. Although the crossover range should not be too narrow, simple reactance circuits are ordinarily too broad in a change over region. A combination of low pass filter for the woofer and a high pass filter for the tweeter is usually employed. With this type of circuit, much more rapid attenuation can be made near the crossover frequency than it is possible with the simple capacitor inductor arrangements. Attenuation of 12 dB per octave is considered proper in most applications. Gradual crossover arrangements attenuate at about 6 dB per octave. Filters with a sharper cutoff than this can be constructed by the use of additional components, but power losses in the filter becomes excessive and the additional sharpness is not necessary anyway. A typical crossover network response graph is shown in figure number 4.38. The curve in the woofer output crosses the curve of tweeter output response at the crossover frequency. This intersection is that the 3 dB or the half power level at the crossover frequency, half the output power is being fed to each unit. The individual response characteristics of the woofer and tweeter must overlap substantially. Impedance matching. It will be useful to give a simple recapitulation of transformer theory. A transformer represents a straightforward application of a phenomena known as electromagnetic induction, whereby any change in the magnetic flux linking an electrical circuit is accompanied by an induced electromotive force in that circuit. The value of this induced voltage will be proportional to the rate of change of the flux while its direction will always be such as to oppose the change producing it. 
the change of linkages may be produced by movement of the electric circuit with respect to a magnetic field which is constant as in a dynamo or by varying the current in a stationary electric circuit when the induced emf produced in one circuit is due to a current varying in a adjacent circuit as in a transformer it is said to be due to the mutual inductance between the two circuit the emf induced in a circuit by a varying current flowing in a circuit itself is said to be due to the self inductance of the circuit the inductance of a conductor can be increased by winding it in a coil and further increased by winding the coil on a core of ferromagnetic material in general transformer consists of two insulated coils of wire so associated that the magnetic flux due to a current in one coil is effectively linked with the turns of the other coil the coils are normally wound on a core of ferromagnetic material which greatly increases the magnetic effect of the current usually one of the windings the one to which the input is connected is called the primary and the other one is called the secondary in some instances additional windings may be provided to give alternative outputs an elementary transformer corresponding to the form used by faraday in his original experiments are shown diagrammatically in 4.40 an alternating current ip flowing in the primary winding will cause an alternating magnetic flux indicated by a dotted lines to circulate in the ring core in doing so this alternating magnetic flux will link with the turns of both windings and induce assuming an ideal transformer an emf that's called e in each turn which is proportional from instant to instant to the rate of change of current in the primary this induced voltage will act in such a direction so as to tend to oppose the change of flux and in the primary winding it will take the form of a back emf if np is a number of turns in the primary winding the total back emf will be equal to npe and neglecting any losses in the transformer this will be equal to the impressed emf ep in other words stability is established when the primary current has a value equal to that required to induce a back emf opposite to the applied emf similarly if ns is a number of turns in the secondary winding the total emf es induced in the secondary winding is equal to ns e so we thus have ep is equal to npe and es is equal to ns e and therefore ep by es is equal to np by ns again assuming an ideal transformer having no losses the power in the secondary circuit will be the same as that at the input to the primary winding thus we have ip ep is equal to is es so that ep by es is equal to is by ip so we therefore have a following relationship np by ns is equal to ep by es that is equal to is by ip thus the ratio of the primary and secondary voltages is equal to the turns ratio while the ratio of the primary and secondary currents is a inverse of the turns ratio the transformer therefore provides a ready means of converting an alternating supply voltage to another value either higher or lower depending on the requirements and this constitutes one of its most common uses where ac mains are used to provide power supplies to telecommunication equipment transformers are are also serving the purpose of isolating the equipment from direct connection to the mains both on grounds of safety and to prevent unwanted earth potentials reaching the equipment apart from their uses in connection with the power supplies transformers find very many uses in telecommunication circuits in signaling and switching circuits they may be used for isolating two parts of a connection 
from direct current while permitting the transmission of speech currents between the two parts. They may also be used to connect an earthed circuit to one which has both sides balanced with respect to earth. A further use of a transformer is for impedance matching. This is to allow a lower impedance circuit to be connected to a high impedance circuit or vice versa without loss of power. In this case, the turns ratio required is equal to the square root of the ratio of the impedances to be matched as can be seen from the following equations. Let Zp will be the impedance as measured at terminals of primary winding. Refer figure number 41. And ZS is equal to impedance of circuit connected to secondary winding. Then ES by IS is equal to ZS and EP by IP is equal to ZP. So therefore ZS by ZP is equal to ES by IS into IP by EP. That is equal to ES by EP into IP by IS. So but ES by EP is equal to IP by IS that is equal to NS by NP. So ZS by ZP is equal to NS by NP whole square. So that NS by NP is equal to square root of ZS by ZP.